Hi, my name is Dan Stiles. I'm a designer and illustrator from Portland, Oregon. In my talk, we're going to be talking about the development of personal style and how to take work that you love and emulate it as opposed to imitate it. I hope you find it inspiring. I love talking about design. Don't you guys love talking about design? Um, so we can all nerd out together. We are here today to talk about style, uh, the development of personal style and the development of personal voice and how to, that's not good. <laughs> all right, test, test. Yeah, good? Okay, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so we're gonna develop personal voice and how to leverage that voice into uh, a practice, you know, how to make a living uh, doing your own work as opposed to doing someone else's. So, but I gotta tell you right off the bat, like, this is not gonna be a life hack, right? There is nothing I can tell you, there's not one weird trick I can show you in the next 15 minutes that is gonna you know, take you from here to here by the time you walk out the door. Right? There are a lot of steps between these two points, but what I wanna do today is I wanna shine some light on these steps, because when I went along this path, I had to do it in the dark. And so if anybody you know, out there chooses to go down this road, you know, maybe I can illuminate part of the path for you. So you know, the, the real first question would be like, what is style, right? And I think we all know what style is when we see it. Just like the good Justice knew what obscenity was when he saw it, uh, we all know style. We all know who made this, right? Whether or not you've seen this particular painting before or not, you know who made this because of the style, right? We all know who made this. We've all seen stencils, and yet somehow we all know this is Banksy because of Banksy's style, right? We all know the work of Barbara Kruger, even if maybe we don't know that a woman named Barbara Kruger did this before. We all know what this looks like. We're all familiar with this style, in spite of the fact that it's almost stick figures. We all know the work of Keith Haring, right? Saul Bass has been ripped off so many times that there's like a Saul Bass ripoff industrial complex out there, just churning this stuff out on Pinterest, right? And it's not just you know, like visual designers, right? <coughs> Filmmakers, Wes Anderson. You know, Wes Anderson not only writes his styles, his, his stories with a certain style, he, he shoots them with style, right? Palette, composition, you know, that's style. Athletes bring style to the game, they move with a style. I could blur out the face and the number on this and we'd all know who this was. Now, 50 years later, we all know the sound of Jimi Hendrix's guitar tone. You know, it's amazing. He, changed, he revolutionized the way we play electric guitar with his style, you know? Some artists are all style. Like, like, it's not just the music, everything, the way they dress, their videos, it's all about style, right? Style is the reason we all know who made this, right? This is not just a picture of Obama. It's Shepard Fairey's Obama, and every single one of us knows that because of the style. Style is the reason nobody knows who made this. <laughs> and, and beyond that, nobody cares, right? Now you might say, okay, well that's, that's kind of unfair, right? Obama is such a huge figure, right? Inspirational, whereas, what is this, corporate recruiting trends? Probably the least inspirational thing you could think of. Right? So, you know, apples and oranges, let me give you an apples to apples comparison. This is a cover I did for Patrick DeWitt's second novel. It was his first novel on a major imprint. He was a completely unknown author at the time. It's about two brothers killing their way across Gold Rush, California. So I did this cover, and, and the book was a huge success. Sold out the, the hardbound edition, and I had drinks with Patrick after that happened, and he said, look, man, I, I really gotta attribute a lot of the success to this, to the cover, because nobody knows who I am. So they, they picked up the book because they liked the cover, which means I did my job. That's what I got hired to do, right? That's, that's our job as designers, is to get people to go to a concert, or pick up a book, or you know, do whatever, click on a button, right? But, after this sold out, the hardbound sold out, they, they changed the cover. They always do this in publishing, I don't know why, but between the softbound and the hardbound, they changed the cover, right? They changed it to this. Now, interestingly enough, if you squint, they're kind of the same, right? It's the two brothers, you know, they're standing there. Uh, but somehow, because of the style, you know, I find this to be lacking. So did Patrick, so did the publisher. Everybody disliked this, but this is what they went forward with. But in spite of that, by that point, the book had become a huge success, New York Times bestseller, as you can see. Right? So it actually got optioned as a movie. And when the movie came out, they changed the cover again. And again, you can see that it's very similar to my cover. Conceptually, all the elements are there, except now the brothers are on horses, they're a little smaller, the skull is now made of the hooves, the dust coming off the hooves. 
But again, stylistically, it falls flat. Would you immediately grab this off the shelf if you were walking through the bookstore? You know, but I, I wouldn't, you know? And I think, I can think of a dozen illustrators who could have killed this concept. Conceptually, this is super strong, right? It's cool, right? It's a big skull. But it's kind of, uh, photo montage, the colors are like all washed out, you know? Like, it just, it doesn't really work. And I think the issue with that is purely style because these are all the same book and practically the same concept, right? So this is the power of style. So I think for what we're talking about today, you know, I know it when I see it isn't, isn't gonna cut it, right? We want a formula for style. You came in here, you know, I'm supposed to deliver something to you that you can leave with. And there is a formula for style, it's not complicated, right? Style is simply a bag of tricks, a set of themes, and a philosophy. That's all style is. Now from a 30,000 foot view, you're like, okay, great. What do I do with that? So what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through some of my work and I wanna show you all these little bits and pieces along the way. You know, here are 15 posters selected largely at random, all from the last couple of years, right? And I wanna show you some of my tricks, right? So first of all, what most people notice when they see my work, they always comment, primary color. They're like, oh, your use of color is great. Uh, you know, I tend to use a lot of colors from opposite sides of the color wheel very bright work. But what a lot of people miss when they notice that is that I don't really use the color black. You know, so these are, these are two tricks that I come back to over and over again. Primary color, sparing use of black. I only use black if there's a conceptual reason to have black. Otherwise, I feel like it's kind of a non-color. It's kind of boring color. There's no line work. I don't ever draw a picture and then color it in like a coloring book I used to. You know, I, I used to draw with brush and ink and then I would color it in, but I've, I've gotten away from that. There's no line work in anything I do. And there's an overwhelming flatness to all of my work. Now these four tricks are the underpinnings for every single thing I make. You will never find anything I made that does not have these four tricks. But there are other tricks that I use along the way, depending on the situation. For instance, negative space. Love me some negative space, right? And the negative space is there for a reason. It draws your eye towards what you're supposed to be looking at. And I have this conversation with clients all the time, and they're like, well, can we, can we put something in there? I'm like, well, it's not negative space anymore if you put something in there, right? <laughs> you gotta fight for that negative space. Pattern. I love pattern. I love old Victorian wallpaper. I love 1970s rugs. I love ugly moo-moos that ladies on the bus are wearing. Like, I just love pattern. I use it all the time. In particular, this wavy line pattern has become kind of synonymous with my work. The filled silhouette. The silhouette was something I kind of discovered. I didn't discover it, like I invented silhouettes, but something I personally discovered in my work when I was working, uh, doing logos. I used to make a lot of logos. And what I figured out was, you know, if you have a strong silhouette of anything, and you reduce it down, you can take it down to like the most mini, like the tiniest size, and you can still see what it, like the little bathroom guy, like he could be like a half an inch tall and you would totally know what that was. That's the power of the silhouette, right? But when you blow it up to poster size, you have a lot of negative empty space to play with. You can fill it, oftentimes with pattern. Integrated typography, I'm a fan of good type. And I feel like when you're designing, you should think about the type. The minute the pencil hits the paper, it's not something you squeeze in at the last minute, like, oh, where am I gonna stick this, you know? Uh, it should be part of your process to design the type into the piece, oftentimes to the point where if you took away one or the other, the whole thing would fall apart. Figure ground, the tricks that they discovered into gestalt uh, psychology, all still work. Use them. They are, they are part of the way your brain works, so you might as well leverage gestalt. Overprinting, I'll talk more about this later, but overprinting is simply the technique of dropping one ink on top of another to make a third. It's become, it used to, I used to do it because I didn't have any money and everything, everything had like two colors of ink and I'm like, eh, how do I get a third out of there? Double Dewey, another thing I learned from uh, doing logos. You know, like uh, you see a great logo, you're like, oh, it's the letter I. Oh wait, it's a face. You know, and you're like, oh, and suddenly it activates your brain and you become kind of part of the piece. It's not a passive process anymore, it's an active process. And uh, the minute you can activate somebody's mind, they're way more likely to pay attention to what you're telling them. Geometry, I love geometry, those, those Bauhaus shapes, circles, squares, triangles. So that's, you know, bag of tricks. And you know, if I showed another 15 images, I could probably find further tricks that I use. But let's talk about themes. 
Themes are things you come back to over and over again. If you like to draw ponies, that's a theme. If you like to do landscapes, that's a theme. And the great thing is about style is you should come back to tricks and themes over and over. When I was first starting out, I thought if I had done something once, I could never do it again. Oh, I did something with figure ground. I could never do that again because then I'm like a one trick pony. But here's the thing, if every single thing you make looks different from every other thing you make, nobody's gonna know you made it, right? There, you, you, that's an anti-style. So, you know, you can, you can repeat your themes, you can repeat your tricks, that is the essence of style. So, all of my themes kind of come from my love of symbolism. I love symbolism. Everybody in this room speaks English, for instance, right? Whether it's your first, second, third language, we all speak English. But we all speak the lingua franca of symbols as well. There are symbols, back to the little bathroom guy. We all know what that means. You know, little trash can icon, we all know what that means. So as a visual designer, being able to leverage symbols that we all already understand are great. You know, it's a shortcut. So some of the you know, symbols that I come back thematically to are faces. I use faces, I only have one example up here, but trust me, I use faces all the time. And what I like about the face is that it shows all human emotion. Every emotion we are possible of having, we can show on a face, you know, so why not use it? There's actually part of our brain uh, that is set up to recognize faces. That is the reason for the phenomenon of pareidolia, where you see two dots in a line, and you're like, oh, that's face, or you see Jesus in your toast. Um, that's, that's pareidolia. And it's because our brain is actually wired to recognize faces. Human infants recognize faces from like day one. It's amazing, so why not leverage that? Likewise, hands, the human hand can convey so much emotion, an open hand versus a fist, two completely different things. And again, humans see that from a very early age. They understand the hand. Animals, we love looking at animals. I don't know why, but what did we paint on the cave walls? Animals. How did we sign it? With our hand. These are ancient symbols, 20,000 years old, and you can still use them today, or at least I love to. Skulls, not a symbol that we have you know, programmed into our brain, but if you go anywhere on planet Earth and show them a skull, they're gonna know what it means death. We all understand this one. And I love, skulls are just so badass, right? Like you can put them on anything and it makes it cool. I actually have to limit myself to like one skull project a month, <laughs> because every, otherwise everything I would just you know, do with a skull. Profiles, not quite as strong as the human face, but the nice thing about the profile is all you need is that brow, the nose, and the lips, and then you'll recognize that as a human, and then you have all the space behind to do something with. It's like empty real estate. You can put whatever you want. They, for instance, can show what the person is thinking. Lips, shortcut to making something look sexy. Lips. Glasses, I love glasses. They do two things, really. They, they obscure someone's identity, but they also, much like the, the, sil the face would give you space on the back when you look at profile, if you look at something from the front and they're wearing glasses, you can put something on the front of somebody's face. It's empty real estate. So, for instance, if somebody's looking at something, you can see their emotion, their reaction. You can also see what they're looking at reflected in the glasses. So you can tell a whole story in one image with just face and glasses. Outer space. We are natural explorers. We are attracted to the unknown. It's a really fun theme and really fun to draw. Smoke, I don't really know why I like this one. I learned to do it in third grade. Smoke coming out of gun barrels, and I just like the cool shape it makes. Danger, we are wired for the fight or flight. So when we see anything dangerous, it immediately, immediately attracts our attention. You know, a couple of snakes will just get your attention. That's how we work, right? So philosophy is a little bit different. Philosophy is like your overarching theory of design or art or film or whatever it is you do. And some people go into it with a philosophy in mind. You know, Mondrian set out to figure out a way to make the most basic art possible. He's like, what is the essence of art? And that's how he wound up paring it down to what you know as the Mondrian style with the primary colors and the rectilinear lines. That was a philosophy that he was going in attacking. A lot of people, most people probably, form their philosophy as they go along. It's how I formed mine. You know, and the first most important thing is concept is king. I don't make anything that doesn't have an idea, and everything I make is telling a story. Right? The sto we are storytellers, first and foremost. Now, you might look at this and be like, well, I mean, what's the story? Why second from the top? Like, why is there a bull for the Arctic monkeys? Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? But that's, uh, that's the Arctic monkeys playing in Birmingham, England. Birmingham, Birmingham England is like the second city of England, if, if London is the first, Birmingham is the second. 600-year-old city, 
right? It started out as a little trading outpost, a little market, and the city grew up around it, became a city of industry, a city of craftspeople. But that market is still there to this day. That market is called the Bullring Market. You see where I'm going with this now, right? So the Bullring Market is still there, right? And if there's a statue of a bull, but what used to go on right in that spot was what they called bull baiting, where they would take a live bull and make it fight with little terriers, you know, bulldog terriers, another great symbol of the UK, which is savage and they don't do that anymore. But the place is still there, the symbol is still there, and so everybody from Birmingham recognizes the symbol of the bull as a symbol of their city. So when their favorite band comes to town, and these are merchandise posters, these are for sale next to the CDs and the t-shirts at the end of the night. And they go and they go, oh yeah, I could get a t-shirt, I could get a CD, oh, but wait, the Arctic Monkey came to my town. My town, the bull town. And so, you know, they're gonna buy this because it speaks to them. And so it may not speak to you because you're from India, but you know, if you're from Birmingham, you will recognize the symbol of the bull and you were the target audience. So, and every, every single one of these, it's got some long monologue behind it like that. Clarity, if you have an idea, you should be able to speak it and put it forward clearly, right? I hope everybody in the back of the room can see each one of these and see what it is. It's not just a big mess. You should convey your message with clarity. I do that with minimalism, as opposed to adding when I make stuff, I take away. I pare stuff down, I pare stuff down. I feel like if something has a lot of clutter, it's probably smoke and mirrors, right? They're, they're making up for the fact that they don't have a good story to tell. Beauty, call me old fashioned, but you know, we live in this post-postmodern world where I could take my shoe off and put it on the stage and say that's art. And nothing you could tell me would make that not art. I mean, that's true, it would be art. If I declare it art, if you declare it art, it's art. It's kind of how it works now, right? But I'm a little bit old fashioned. The stuff that I like to look at and the stuff that I want to put out into the world, I want it to be beautiful. I do not want to leave like a trail of garbage behind me. And last, you know, is it compelling? Which is kind of hard to put your finger on. Like, what does that mean? But when I look at something and I, I, just, I just want to look at it, then I feel like, okay, that compels me. And if it, makes, if it compels me, then I feel like, okay, it'll compel you. And if it doesn't compel me, even if it checks all the other boxes, I'll throw it out, start over. Right? And you can apply this formula to any style. This isn't just my work. You know, let's go back, let's look at the work of Barbara Kruger, the oft ripped off Barbara Kruger. And the reason she's so ripped off is that she has honed her style to a knife point that she like jams in the viewer's eye. Like it is so good. Like her bag of tricks is really, really simple. Black and white photography, tight crop, large scale, everything she does is, is really big. You can actually see the grain of the photos. Pithy aphorisms, meaning she has good copy. I shop, therefore I am, is good copywriting. And the ubiquitous red square, always with futura, bold, oblique. Always, right? And that is her style. And, and it's so easy to rip off because you don't need to know how to draw. You don't need to be a typographer. You don't need to be a photographer. Anybody can rip this off. Maybe not well, but it's easy to rip off, at least the look of it. But, where it gets better are her themes. You know, she's, she's looking at the greatest ills of our society. She's looking, she's looking at sexism, consumerism, greed. You know, she's, she's really pointing this back at us, and that's where the, real, the brilliance of what she does is her philosophy. It's social commentary. She's using the language of consumerism and pointing it back at itself, which now we've all seen before. There are magazines like Adbusters that are full of that kind of thing, right? But somebody got there first, and her name was Barbara Kruger, right? It's brilliant. She recontextualized the language of advertising, which at the time was, it was a stunning achievement, right? But she is often ripped off. And why is she ripped off? Because it's easy to do her style. Like, the, the way it looks, those, that bag of tricks is fairly easy to do. But when anybody gets ripped off, they almost never take the themes, right? They will if you do bunnies or something like that, right? But nobody's gonna steal your theme of looking at sexism and racism and greed. Like, you can't sell that. And they never, they never steal the philosophy, right? So when Supreme is selling you something, they aren't saying, oh, you know, you should really check your consumerism. They're just saying, oh, you know, buy some shoes, buy a t-shirt. Right? They've actually taken her message and inverted her inversion back into what she was mocking in the first place. All right, so that's kind of a 30,000 foot view of style, and I need a drink. I'm sorry, it's gonna be like a little AMSR for a second here while you listen to me drink. Let's see if we can hear this. Yeah.
All right. <clears throat> But, you know, the only person, the only life I've ever lived is my own, right? So I can really only speak from my own experience. So I want to talk to you about the, the story of me finding my voice, finding my style. And as with most things, it goes back to childhood. Like the stuff you thought was cool when you were seven or when you were nine, I can guarantee you still think is cool to this day, right? Because your brain is so plastic at that age that everything just has such a huge impact. Whereas seeing something when you're... 30, 40, 50, you're like, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's cool, right? But man, when you're a kid, you just live for this stuff. And when I was a kid, I loved the funny papers. When the newspaper came every day, I'd go and I'd tear out that page and I'd read all those funnies and I would learn to draw them all. And that led to an interest in comic books, which quickly led to an interest in like underground comic books because the stories were better, the art was better. I would go around the neighborhood and I would buy like old mad magazines from yard sales for a nickel. And the thing is, I was, you know, I was like eight years old and I'm buying mad magazines that are eight years old. So I don't know what they're making fun of because I'd never seen the, I mean, I'd never seen Apocalypse Now. I'm, I don't know what this is, right? But I just love the irreverence. I was reading comics like Doonesbury, even though I didn't know there was a place called Vietnam and there was a war there. Like, I, I'm six, right? Nobody told me this stuff. But I, I just loved any drawn anything, right? I also did a lot of reading. I read a lot of like sci-fi, a lot of swords and sandals, fantasy fiction type stuff. And they all came with these fantastic covers. I mean, look at that cover, right? The Princess of Mars. I can guarantee you this scene never happened in the book. There was no point where some giant barbarian dude's got a sword and there's a woman clinging to his leg and like, but the covers just sold it, right? I also played a fair amount of Dungeons and Dragons. And the weird thing is like through the lens of Stranger Things, through the lens of nostalgia, this stuff is so cool. But I gotta tell you, man, this wasn't cool. I was a weird kid, like this was weird kid stuff. Like this was not what the normal kids were into. You know, and like what do weird kids do when they go to high school? They become punk rockers, right? <laughs> that is what you did in 1981 or whatever. Like you, cause punk rock was great. The great thing about punk rock was the music was just the glue, but it held together a larger ecosystem of skateboarding, of art, of illustration and design. Like there was, if you were into anything, you could find a home in the world of punk rock. Hip hop's the same way. It's an ecosystem, right? And so it was my introduction to branding. Every good band had a great logo, right? I was just walking on the street out here today and I saw that Misfits logo in a store window. The 14 year old kid who's gonna buy that is not gonna have ever heard the Misfits, but the logo is so good. They're gonna be like, that's badass, I want that, right? That is the power of good branding. Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, great logos. Skateboards all had art with, you know, Jim Phillips, puss head on the bottom. Awesome art, those things are all collectible today. This was my introduction to posters. You know, I'd, go, I'd collect all the flyers off the telephone poles and I'd, I'd hang them on my wall three layers deep. A friend of mine went to San Francisco and he came back with a book called The Art of Rock, Paul Grushkin's anthology. And it, it showed me that, you know, I had heard of Jimi Hendrix, I had heard of Jefferson Airplane, but I had no idea there were these magnificent posters that went along with that time period of music. Because in the pre-internet era, you know, if you didn't know about something, you just didn't know about it, and you never were, unless somebody was like, hey, look at this, you know? Which is how I learned about many things, including this book. Actually, Paul Grushkin wrote the foreword to my book. Uh, I became friends with him, and, and before he passed, actually, I was, I was like, look, man, your book had such a huge effect on me. I have a book coming out. Would you please write the foreword? Uh, because he kind of put me on this path with that, that book that he made. I was doing, I changed my reading from Swords and Sandals to like Gonzo Journalism, Hunter Thompson, and his trusty uh, sidekick, Ralph Stedman. And that brush flick that Stedman does, you can see it in the art there, I still use that splatter technique, you know, and, uh, and the lettering style. So, you know, I went off to college, and I started making posters of my own. And this is the kind of stuff, and I think you can see all that input, and you can see the kid who liked the funny papers, you can see the kid who liked, you know, misfits and circle jerks and all that in this style. I started doing comics, like full page, back page comics, or for, there was a, like a campus magazine, so they would give me the back page every month and I could do whatever I wanted with it. Taught myself how to screen print, start making color work. And about halfway through college, I realized there's a name for this. It's called graphic design. It's, it's a job, right? <laughs> Because up until that point, everything I had been doing, like all my friends were creative, they played guitar, or they did, you know, like creativity was just sort of a thing that everybody had, but I came to realize that's actually not true. We are all fairly rare in the fact that we like this, we enjoy this, and we're good at this. And this is a saleable skill. 
Now, at that point, I was halfway through my degree already, so I just finished up and I got a sociology degree. But don't laugh, it was cool, I learned a thing or two. Uh, when I got out, I immediately started what I call like a grassroots effort to develop a design career. So I went and I got every crappy design industry job I could get. I printed t-shirts, I swept floors, I drove deliveries, I worked in digital pre-press, I did anything I could to get into the design industry. And after a couple of years of that, I was broke and I was unhappy and I was no closer to being a designer and an illustrator, which was my goal. So I went back to school. I came down to California, I went to CCA, in San Francisco, and I got a proper design education. At that point in time, this is about the, let's say, late 90s, mid 90s, David Carson was like the big thing. He's up in the corner there where you basically do a keyboard smash and smear it all over the page. Um, so he was like the big style. Everybody was like, oh, David Carson's so cool. But I, I also learned about history. Like, you know, what is a good logo? Who was Paul Rand? What is, you know, who was Paula Cher? Emigre Magazine was going on in Oakland at that point in time, and they were just the cutting edge of typography and design. I learned design history, you know, Swiss design, constructivism, de Stiel. I also was introduced to stuff like the bottom, the uh, yellow and pink in the corner there, the Designers Republic. They were the first people who convinced me that the computer was capable of making cool art. Like up until that point, I was like all about pen and ink and you know, punk rock. And they took this like really corporate language and smashed it headlong into electronic music and made this crazy like bastardization of style in the UK, it was so cool. And I was like, oh, you know, there's, you can do something with computers beyond just production, which is how I viewed it up to that point was a production tool. So I was hired directly out of the classroom to work for Michael Cron, And this was the uh, dot-com era. And we sat there and man, we made logos. We just made so many logos because there were so many companies just coming out of nowhere with all kinds of money, venture capital money. He sat here, I sat here, first chair, second chair. We just banged out logos, and then the crash happened, and every single one of those companies went away, right? I don't even remember what those logos looked like. I couldn't find them, so I'm like, oh, yeah, here's some stand-ins, right? <laughs> the only one company that still exists to this day is TiVo, and that's not one of mine. That's actually one of Michael's, so I can't even, I can't even take credit for the one that, that you know, survived. The rest of them disappeared. And you know, after the crash, I was like, you know, I love working for you, but I'm always gonna be second chair in your office. Right? You get first chair, your name's on the door, I'm gonna sit here, and so I've gotta go out on my own. You know, nothing grows in the shadow of tall trees. So I went out and I, you know, I started doing my own work, and I really thought, I'm like, okay, here's my chance. Here's my chance to do the work I want to be doing, right? All the things that inspire me, everything that took me to this point. But at that point, I'd been doing this sort of tech, dot com, PowerPoint, you know, stuff. And that was just, I just got more of that kind of work. And I, I refer to that as generic style du jour. It just looked like every other logo in the Bay Area at that point in time. I got hired to like just make the design widgets, right? And it paid pretty well. You know, I was no complaint for, for what I was getting paid, but it wasn't the work I wanted to be doing. Somehow I had, even though I'd gone out on my own, I was still like not doing my own work, if that makes any sense. So we, uh, we actually left the Bay Area, I got married, and my wife and I, we moved up to Portland, Oregon, into a house about eight times the size of our apartment. And in the basement, I set up a printing studio. And I started making my own work again. Right? And financially, kind of here's how that looks, right? I was, uh, I was making 100% of my income still doing this, this generic tech me work, right? But around the sides, early morning, late at night, weekends, you know, I was doing the little, the cherry on top, the weird little things that I wanted to do. And I would do it for 20 bucks, 100 bucks. Like, you need an album cover, what do you, what do you pay? Like, I don't care. Just give me some, some amount of money. I want to do this. And for like three years, that carried on, right? Just did the, did the personal stuff around the sides, did the nine to five stuff. Actually, more like probably nine to nine. And then from 10 to midnight, I did my own stuff, right? And then in 2007, a weird thing happened. I started getting attention from different companies for the personal work. Like I was starting to get, the first one that comes to mind, AT&T. They saw a little CD cover I did for $500 for a folk music compilation and they said, we love this. Can you just take this and expand on it? And we're gonna do a national advertising campaign based on that. And I can guarantee you that pays a lot more than $500, right? So I started getting this traction with the personal work, which was weird, right? But then 2008, catastrophe, the Great Recession. Half of my corporate clients went away, just vanished. 
2009, I lost another half. And by 2010, all my clients were gone. I should have been knocking on the door over at Nike, begging to do color separations for t-shirts, just to like keep my house, right? But amazingly, you know, what filled the gap was the weird side projects. Like the more time and effort I put into these things and the more of them I put out there, the more came back to me. It had this like snowball effect. And I know you all were hoping I would offer you something better, like all you gotta do is send a postcard to you know, Target and they'll hire you. Like, that, unfortunately, that's not how anything in life works. If you look at dating, if you look at finding cool bands, like, they come to you. You can't really go to them. But the way they come to you is by putting out work that they find attractive, right? And that's where I am today. Like, this is all I do. I have clients like the Arctic Monkeys and the Portland Trailblazers and McDonald's and, you know, Cartoon Network. Like, this is what I get paid to do now, just my own, like, weird stuff, which is cool. But I want to go back to this notion of style de jour for a minute. Right? Like, what is style de jour? What do I mean? What I mean by style de jour is that every five, six, seven, eight years, there is a sort of global style to everything. Right? There's a reason we all know within a couple of years when each one of these was made. Recognizably 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Right? These all are done in a style that is recognizable for the time. And why does that happen? Well, if you're familiar with any kind of racing, bicycle racing, car racing, running, you know that there's always somebody out in front, and they're running all the risk, but they're also going to get all the reward because they're going to win the race. But behind them, there's a little pocket of, of like unturbulent air, smooth air that you can get into. It's called slipstreaming or drafting. It's why when you watch the Tour de France, there's five bikes that are tire to tire, because the guys behind don't have to pedal quite as hard. Right? So you always wind up with somebody slipping into number two, and then somebody slipping in behind them. Number eight, number 10, number 100, number 1,000. And once you have enough people lined up behind one style, you get style du jour. I think a good example of that would be Apple with the iMac G3. Right? When Steve Jobs came back to Apple, they were suffering. They were hurting, right? And at that point in time, any computer you bought, regardless of whether it was Apple, Dell, Microsoft, it was a beige box with a monitor either on top or you put the computer on the floor sideways. Beige box. And Steve Jobs said, no. You know, we're going to put everything back in one box like we did with the original Mac, and we're going to make it in this insane jelly bean shape. People are going to love it. And people did. People went apeshit for these things, right? It was the hu I mean, it saved Apple. It literally was the computer that saved Apple, right? But what happened was, starting from that moment, you couldn't buy any piece of electronics that wasn't in this weird translucent case. Right? Translucent pagers, translucent zip drives, translucent Nintendo controllers. It wound up jumping the firewall until you, like, you couldn't buy furniture without it being clear. <laughs> like, style du jour. But the problem is, like, you know, why do you want... Crap, that didn't work. Why do you want your own style? You know, because you want to do your own work. Like, doing style du jour is easy, but it's not really your work. If you're the guy making the, the clear pager, does anybody care? Like, no, do you care? Like, nobody cares about that, right? It's just, it's just sort of like me too kind of stuff, right? If you think about the stuff that you love and everybody has a list of things that they think are brilliant and it's different person to person, right? If you think about the work that you love, every single one of those things is the work of an individual creative vision, either by one person or a very, very small team of people. Creative vision. If you look at, you know, Jamie Reed, God Save the Queen. He's the person who invented that cut and paste punk rock style that now, like, you see anything in that cut and paste, you're like, oh, funk, you know, punk rock. But nobody cares, right? But when Jamie Reed did this, people would punch Johnny Rotten in the mouth when he went out on the streets because he had done this to the Queen. It was that effective. Have you ever done anything so effective that people punched you in the mouth? You know, <laughs> like, he invented that style and he gets all the glory. He was the number one bike. And that, or, or you look at, you look at this, uh, Jack Kirby, I can't believe I forgot his name for a second there. You look at the Jack Kirby, and like, it wasn't like a bunch of dudes in those fleece vests, you know, with the chinos, we're all sitting around an oak table going like, you know what's on style this month? I think Odin, Odin would sell, you know, like this is just one guy freaking out at a drawing board at like three in the morning, right? This is not on trend, like this was just somebody doing their best work, like having a, having a creative vision. Now, okay, so that's great. 
You want to do your own work, right? But maybe you need a more pragmatic reason. You need a pragmatic reason to have your own style, right? The pragmatic reason would be the creative careers are under attack, right? Democratization is killing art as a service. Right? Once upon a time, if you were, say, a plumber, and you wanted to get a logo, you had to go to a place where there's a room full of people bent over drafting boards, and you would probably talk to the person whoever's name was on the door, and you'd say, hey, I'm a plumber, I need a logo, and they would, you'd go back and forth with some pencil sketches, and eventually you'd hit on something, and they would pass that pencil sketch to one of these people, and they would use all these arcane tools to draw it up, you know, with India ink and placa, and then they would, they'd call a guy on the phone, they'd call a typographer, they'd say, hey, we need some Universe 55, says plumber, and that guy would set the type, and then he would send out for film, and the film would get sent out to paper, and then the paper would come back to the designer who would then literally cut it out and wax it down below the logo, and then that would get sent back to film, and then that would get sent back to paper, and then finally that would all get sent back to the original designer who would then pass that off to the plumber on a page with like eight or 10 logos on it. And every time they wanted to use a logo, they had to cut one out with a pair of scissors and stick it into the ad. There were dozens of people involved in every single one of these projects. And then this happened. And every single one of those people lost their job. And this is about where I came on the scene. Like when I was working those crappy, you know, design-ish jobs, graphic industry jobs, you know, I'd go to work at a digital pre-press place in these big like airplane hangar buildings. And then all this equipment laying around collecting dust. And I'd be sitting at a bank of computers because the computers were so slow, you would get one going and you'd go down to the next one and get it going. And, uh, but I'd say, hey, you know, what, what's this? Oh, that's a stat camera. We don't use that anymore. Oh, what used to happen back there? Well, we used to strip film. You know, we don't do that anymore. All got put out by this, right? But at least this was a skill. Like, I could operate the computer. I could operate the software. The computer itself was worth, you know, in today's dollars, probably like $10,000. The software was crazy expensive. Nobody knew how to use a computer back then. Just knowing how to sit at a computer and like open a window was like a skill. But you're not safe from that anymore either, right? Now you can go to Fiverr or 99designs or 48 logo hours and, and you, can get a, you can get a logo. The, the plumber can get a logo for five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever they want, you know, whatever you name your price, right? And there's some poor guy in like Bangladesh sitting there like making them on his phone or something for $2 an hour, right? So the low hanging fruit is all gone. You can't make a living laying out business cards or you know, doing production for somebody's shop. Like that's all been consumed by a sort of crowdsourcing and technology. And if that's not bad enough, like the computer itself is coming for your job, right? You're gonna hear a lot this weekend about Sensei. <laughs> They're not gonna invite me back after I say this, right? But okay, so they say like Sensei is gonna make you as powerful as 10 designers, young grasshopper, and I don't, I, I believe it. I, I totally believe that when Adobe says that it will give you the power of 10 designers, that it probably will. But if you work in an office with 10 designers, and you are now as powerful as 10 designers, what happens to the nine people, right? Unless your office starts taking in 1,000% more work, there's not enough work to go around. Like, here's an example from the world of photography. Like, once upon a time, if you needed a picture of a person on a phone, you'd have to have a, have, get a model, get a photographer, get some lights, get a person on the phone, and you would get a really nice photo of a person on the phone, and it would cost you several thousand dollars. Then stock came along and put most photographers out of business, because you could now license a photo of a person on the phone for 200, 800, whatever, depending on your usage. Then iStock came along, and now you can get a kind of <laughs> crappy photo of a person on the phone, but it's like a buck, you know? But this is uh, done by a company called NVIDIA. They make graphics cards, probably have one in your computer. And this is not a real product, but this was a demo for their AI. And what this is on the left is an interface where you draw you like an MS Paint kind of thing, like a blue is sky, green is trees, and you just you hack in whatever you want to hack in, and then you push a button, and it generates a photo for you. You don't even need a photographer to get a photo. So imagine if they actually like make this a little better. You could just kind of draw in your person on the phone and push a button. No photographer needed, right? Creatives are on the run. Fiverr's coming for you, Skynet's coming for you. <laughs> but if you have a style, you can, like, you can invert that relationship, right? Because having a distinctive style makes you desirable. 
Like, I've shown you this once already, right? But I, I need to reiterate, all these people came to me. Like, I don't door knock, I don't have a marketing team. I wake up in the morning and there's an email that says, hey, McDonald's would like you to do the McRib campaign. How do you, what do you think of that? I'm like, hell yeah, right? But all of these are like that. I didn't go out looking for the, you know, you can't even do that, right? And then again, you're like, Dan, this is what you gotta tell me, like, you know, build it and they will come, but it's true. Just like dating and anything else, right? If you make yourself too eager, you go knock on the door at Target and say, here's my portfolio, you really think they're gonna hire you? Like, that's kind of unfortunately not how it works, right? You need to put a bunch of great work out there and they'll see it and they'll come to you. So you're like, okay, great, Dan, good for you, you know? But how do I do that? That's what I paid to come in here to learn about today, right? So, you know, I've, I've actually kind of gone back, and like I said, I, I fell into a lot of this backwards, right? I didn't have a, a clear path. But I've tried to sort of reconstruct the, how to create a style in a set of steps, you know? So here's my, my three-step method to the development of style. All right, step one, input. Step two, processing. Step three, output. And what do I, what do I mean by that? Input, you're probably already doing this, right? This is the fun one. You know, be a student of your field. Suck in work like a sponge. I have thousands of design work, or design books. I have a whole folder on my desktop dedicated to any time I see an image I like, I grab it and I throw it in the folder. Just, I just collect these things, piles of them. I just soak in work. And you create a catalog in your head, like, honestly, by the time I die, I want to have seen every poster ever made. And I don't know if that's possible or not, but I'm trying really, really hard. Right? And you use this catalog to develop good taste. If you've only ever heard one song in your life, you don't know if it's good or bad. But by the time you've heard 100 songs, by the time you've heard 1,000 songs, you can go like, oh, you know, this one's good, this one's bad. You, you develop taste by looking at tons and tons of work. Right? Here's an example from that folder. And I think you can kind of see how this stuff's rubbed off on me, right? Either I pick it because it looks like my work, or it, it, you know, I, I like it and it somehow has an effect on my work. These are just things I see that I think are great. Number two, processing. This is the hard part. This is the part where I think a lot of people will give you the advice to steal like an artist. And I think steal is the wrong word. I think stealing is like imitating, right? I want you to emulate, not imitate. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you see something you like, don't just sit there and go like, oh yeah, I can do that too. You know, that's just getting in behind that's being the number two bike, right? But look at it and say, why does this work? Why is it that I like this? And go like, oh, you know what it is? It's the angles. The angles give it a, a sense of dynamism, or it's the colors, the colors, the way the colors work. And the minute you analyze something and you figure out why it works, you can now take that trick and add it to your bag of tricks. You've learned something from this other person. This other person becomes your teacher, as opposed to somebody who you're just ripping off. You know, to give you a, a musical example, in 1978, a little band called Van Halen released their first album. And on that album was a song called Eruption. Eruption is basically a minute and a half long guitar solo. And that one song was enough to cement Eddie Van Halen as a guitar god. Millions of kids went out and bought guitars after hearing just that song. But now you can go on YouTube, and you can see dozens, if not hundreds of people nailing that logo, or that, Jesus, nailing that song. <laughs> Note for note, all right? I mean, this girl's like 14, and she can play that note for note. It's amazing, but it's imitation. And imitation's fine when you're 14, but if you go, guitar, go to Guitar Center, like, there are 30-year-old guys in there who can play every great song ever. They can play every riff from every song, but they can't write their own because they've only ever learned to imitate. You know? So, back to the work of Shepard Ferry. There's a guy on Fiverr who you can pay 20 bucks, and he will take any photo, and he will make it look just like Obama's, or the Obama Hope. Except, obviously, he kind of sucks, right? <laughs> like, not only, you do that again, the ASMR. Um, not only is he, just imitating, but he's imitating poorly, which is sad because you could learn something, honestly, by just sitting down with, Obama's, with, the, with the Obama print and trying to figure out how Shepard Ferry did what he did, you could learn a lot about high contrast art. You know, this is, this is masterfully done, even if we all know that it's a photo and he got in a lot of trouble for using a photo reference, 
He did a really good job. Right? You could learn something. He did not do that with Photoshop filters, which is what this other guy did. So not only is it an imitation, but it's a poor imitation. But if you want to talk about somebody who emulates, Prince was a master. If you read any interview with Prince and people say, who, who do you like? You know, who are your favorite bands? He would happily list off all of his favorites, right? Carlos Santana, James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, the greats. And when you listen to Prince's music, you can hear that he learned from the masters. But at no point in any of his songs do you just go like, oh man, that's just a P-Funk ripoff. You never say that because he learned and he folded that information into his own music. He learned from his teachers and then made his own music by learning those lessons as opposed to just imitating, which so many people do. So what I'm saying is, you know, learn a technique, you know, like find a technique and then make it your own. Like you don't just need to imitate, you can, you can figure out why it works and make it your own and then it, you can add that to your bag of tricks. Which leads to three, output. You know, once you have a trick, whether you found it on your own or whether you learned it from somebody else, map the area around it. Use it more than once. You know, if you like figure ground, try something, you know, play with it, make another thing, make 20 more things. Really figure out what figure ground has for you. You know, map the area around it. And then, once you have a couple tricks, and this is really the foundation of style right here, this is the moment where it gels, start to combine them. And that's really all it is. It's the combination of tricks that gives you a recognizable style. Now, here's an example, here's something I did. This is a poster for Blondie. Summer Before Last, Blondie is out there. They have a new album. They're still doing it, right? But admit it, when you go to see Blondie, they're a throwback act. You want to hear Heart of Glass, right? You want to hear Rapture. You want to hear sort of 1978 to 1982, the heyday of Blondie. And so when I was tasked with making a poster for them, I wanted to do something that kind of evoked that period of time, but I didn't want to just do like, ooh, 80s dance party, like, you know, so many knockoff 80s graphics. So how could I make something that said 80s, but looked like I made it? So I looked sort of to the teachers. You know, what have I learned from all these people about 80s art? And the first one you have to go to is the Memphis Group. Now the Memphis Group, unfortunately, nobody knows their name. But in 1981, a little group in Italy called the Memphis Group, named after an Elvis song, actually, uh, they did an interior design exhibit where they literally coined that entire 80s style the pastel colors, the circles, the triangles, the grid patterns, the little dot patterns. All of that came from one tiny little Italian design group. That whole MTV look, it's all thanks to the Memphis group. They were the number one bike in that line, that 10 year long line of knockoffs, right? So you'd have to make some kind of reference to what you learned from them, right? To have a truly 80s look. You know, I knew I wanted Debbie Harry in there somehow. Debbie Harry is not Blondie. She's the lead singer to Blondie. But when you think Blondie, you think Debbie Harry. She was definitely going to be in my poster. So who did the best girly art of the 80s? Nagel, hands down, right? But it's also New York. Maybe some pop art, even though it's not necessarily the 80s. Maybe some Warhol. Maybe some Liechtenstein. And I wanted to do my own type. I tend to draw my own typography when I can. I wanted to have those basic shapes, the triangle, the square, the circle. But that actually is uh, 1930s. That, that came from the geometric period. There's an example from A.M. Cassandra, the poster artist. Right? But then I finally, I, I got it all kind of set up and I had a problem, right? No matter how I made the type, it looked like she was eating it. Like it looked like it was going in her mouth and I'm like, ah, I'm really stuck. But I kind of went back, I'm like, what do I know? What have I learned to make it look like it's projecting? You know, Alexander Rodchenko, 1924, he figured that out. You put a little cone around it, it looks like it's coming out of their mouth. And he didn't invent this trick, like other people have done this as well. And I, I want to be clear, I didn't sit down with these six images and go, how can I combine these into a poster? Like, that's, that's not how it works, but when you start looking through the, through the catalog in your head, you know, this is the stuff that comes forward. Given whatever the design problem, if you've learned enough things from enough places, from enough teachers, you can reconstruct stuff and sort of make your own Prince song. Which brings us to this idea of originality, right? And I'm not gonna read this quote to you, you can all read, but I, I think we can all agree that Mark Twain, probably a great creative, right? But I love his idea of we're all working with the same little pieces of glass. And the originality, the novelty comes from the combinations of those, th 
one of those things, because you're never, you're never going to create new form, right? You're not going to create a new shape that nobody's ever seen. You're not going to write a kind of music that's literally never been heard. And I can guarantee you, if you did, people would run screaming. Like, they don't know what to do with things that are that new. At best, you would die in poverty, and 50 years later, people would be like, whoa, that guy was really far ahead of his time, right? But more than likely, just nobody would accept it. It would be too weird. People like a little flavor of the past. That's how it works. So really, what you're trying to do is come up with novel combinations, right? So don't get too hung up on originality. Now, I'm not saying you should just go ripping people off. You know, don't do that. This isn't license to rip off, right? But here's Shepard Fairey. Here's that Rodchenko I just showed you. you know, are there enough pieces of glass in that kaleidoscope? I don't know. That's up to you to decide, right? Johnny Ive, great industrial designer. Dieter Rams, possibly a better industrial designer. All right? People even like to talk about Picasso. Picasso went through his African period, where he learned a lot from African artists. There, the brutal colonization of Africa was happening around 1906, where the Europeans moved south and said, this is ours. But one, one of the things that happened out of that was a lot of African arts that are coming north. And artists were introduced to things they had never seen before. A whole new flavor of art, because the world was much smaller back then. They had, in Europe, you just didn't see these things. And Af you know, Picasso saw the brilliance in the Dan masks. And he learned from his teachers. And about two years later, he was done with that. He was done with his African period. He moved on to do Cubism. But he learned from his teachers. So, you know, we're going to be running short on time here, but I want to talk, I want to give you a couple case studies, right? I want to talk about, I want to talk about my first trick. Now, if any of you are familiar with skateboarding, you will know that ollieing is the essential trick to all flatland skateboarding tricks. You tap the tail, you push the front, you get the board off the ground. From there, you can do a kickflip, you can ollie down some stairs, you can spin, you can do whatever you want, right? But if you can't ollie, you can't skate, right? It is the essential trick to skateboarding. First trick you should learn. So going back to my basement in Portland, I was trying really hard to find a new style. Like I'd been working for Cronin, I'd been doing all this generic design. I just, I was reaching around and I, I wound up kind of going back to the pen and ink style because it was comfortable, but it was, it wasn't me anymore, right? It wasn't genuinely what I wanted to be doing. So I, uh, I actually got a job doing a poster for Dizzy Rascal. Dizzy Rascal is a rapper out of the UK, and he has a very different style than a lot of American rappers. He raps in a style called grime. And the thing about grime was that the, the, the vocal delivery and the beats are almost unsyncopated. It's really cool the way he pulls this off. It's a, it's a great sound. You should check out Boy in the Corners, first album. And I, you know, I tried making all these posters, and they all sucked. I was having a really hard time finding something that I liked. And it, eventually, I just took the press photo they sent, which you nobody know, ever uses the press photo, right? But I took it, and I just traced the lines of his face. You can see the lines of his face, and you can see where I just took the pencil tool and traced those out. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. This kind of looks like something. You know, going through that catalog in my head of things that I liked, it, it sort of had this graffiti look, this marker look. You know, it actually reminded me a lot of the work of Doze Green, a graffiti artist who eventually became a gallery artist. Right? And I was like, oh man, this is, this is, I'm, maybe I'm onto something here. I've got, a, I've got a deadline, I'm gonna run with this. So you know, I started messing with it, I made the lines fatter, I made some like, arrows coming out of his mouth to look like he's rapping, I put a hat on him. You know, like, but it still, it just wasn't gelling. And at a certain point, I took the blue image, I took the red image, and I dropped them on top of one another. And suddenly, it looked like the music sounded. It had a vibration. And I was like, oh, I think that might be it. I think I might have gotten something here, right? So that was the poster, right? But if you're looking at that original list of tricks that I went through early in the presentation, you can see a couple here. No black, overprinting, and what my friends like to call the Dan Styles color palette, which is this blue-red overprint combo, right? This was my Ollie. I finally found something that I could kind of grab onto, a toehold. Right, so I started doing you know, more stuff using this style. Right, I got a job for Sonic Youth, another band I really, really like. Did 12 things I hated. Finally fell into this one, using the exact same set of tricks, except I got rid of the line work. I dropped the line work, and all of a sudden everything went flat. That's where you get the flatness that I still use. But again, the no black, the overprinting, the color palette. I was like, oh, OK, this is working. I wound up selling it to a bigger client. 
Bumbershoot Music Festival up in Seattle, largest urban music festival in the country. Exact same colors, same trick. It's like three tricks rolled into one. That's it. That's all it is. But then I was like, well, you know, I've already got C and M. What if I had Y? Can I add a third color? And now you've got the primary color palette. And if you look at that earlier list I gave you, you know, the essential parts of my style were all laid down right there in like one year. You know, when I talk about the wavy line pattern I use, this is probably the earliest that I could find that I used that. And it's, it's not even quite there yet. You know, it's not quite the same pattern. But you got the wavy line and you have the silhouette. In this case, silhouette of a bird. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. What if I invert that? What if I put the pattern inside the animal? And again, I'm like, okay, I'm onto something, right? So you can take that, you can, again, you can repeat yourself. Themes, you can repeat themes. You know, tricks, you can repeat tricks. So I sold that to the Squamish Music Festival. And then here's where it starts getting really cool. Is, you know, you've got this wavy lines and silhouettes. You've got this overprinting and vibration. You know, what if you combine that all in one image? And you get these kind of super combos where you have multiple tricks stacked on top of one another. I think this was uh, 2014. Last summer, I still did some more work for Arctic Monkeys, and you can still see that essential set of tricks. It's a filled silhouette with a pattern. Right? Like so many of those tricks, you can repeat and repackage in new ways. So it's that combination of tricks that really gives you a style. Right? That's all it is. So then the question is, like, how do you keep this up? How do you not go stale? You're the new hotness for a year, two years, whatever. But then what? And I don't really know, because I kind of hope I'm going to be doing this for another 20 years or so. So, like, I'm not done, so I can't really be like, well, this is what worked for me. But, you know, the theory is you just you know, you kind of keep going, keep getting better, keep finding new tricks, new combinations. You know, like, here's some older work. You've been, we've been looking at this for the last hour, right? Here's some newer work. Right? And I think you can see, you know, many of those same tricks are there, same themes are there, but I've kind of added some new stuff, right? There's more granular detail. There's more color. The more color is simply because I now have bigger budgets, right? So now I can use six colors instead of two. And along with overprinting, it makes it look like nine colors. You know, there's new themes, new combinations of themes. But I think probably the most striking thing is I'm starting to use one-point perspective a lot more. Not everything I do has one-point perspective in it, but you can see each one of these has some element that's kind of sticking off the page, right? So I've just kind of tossed a new trick into the bag of tricks. Okay, so we're kind of done for the day, right? So, in summary, what is style? We've determined that style is really just three things. It's a bag of tricks, a set of themes, and a philosophy. But in order to build that, you know, you need the input. You need to, you need to suck in work like a sponge. And then you need to process that work by learning from it. You can't just imitate it. You need to emulate it. You need to figure out why you like these things. And you need to pull those things into your own bag of tricks. And then, when you output, you combine all these things in new and novel ways. Which is why I couldn't give you, at the beginning, like one weird trick, right? Because it's actually like this sort of pepper mill thing that lasts a lifetime. And there is, no, there is no quick way to do this. We live in a society where everybody is like, oh, you know, we can give you 30-minute abs. Or we can teach you Spanish on an app in, you know, a month. And that's like a lie. We all know that's a lie, right? This is exactly the same way. I mean, the biggest thing you can do for yourself is practice, right? Make as many things as you possibly can, and you'll get better at it. That is unfortunately the way it goes. So, I mean, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I'm on Instagram, it's like the only one I use. I mean, I'm Dan Styles on like every form of social media, but I only ever post Instagram. Uh, and there's a survey, fill out the survey if they like me, if you like me, maybe they'll bring me back, I don't know. But thanks for coming out. <laughs>